A young boy is sitting on a landing outside his dormitory. His pants are wet because during the night this traumatized child could not control his bladder. What he needs is a soft, reassuring hand on his shoulder, a hug, to hear some kind words. Instead, he is ordered by a wicked sister to stop his blasted weeping and adhere to the strict code of silence. He is scolded and told that he is a disgusting and dirty little wretch who was rightly abandoned by his parents. The sister, someone who has vowed to show some mercy to the child, takes out a leather strap and whips him until blood oozes from his already scarred skin. The boy is then sent back to his bed and told he won't be eating for the next 24 hours. As for a change of clothes, maybe he'll get that in a day or two. The scene we just described to you is not an exaggeration, and in fact, much worse things happen to children who were in the care of a group of Roman Catholic nuns called the Sisters of Mercy. Abuses such as this went on for decades, and it was only recently that the sisters admitted their guilt and agreed to pay out many millions in compensation. But who were these Sisters of Mercy? Were they always so ruthless and cruel? Are they still this brutal? The foundation was started in Ireland in 1831 with the intention of helping the most needy in society. Over many years, the Sisters of Mercy spread globally, taking the deprived into their orphanages, their workhouses, and their boarding schools. The woman who started the foundation was one Catherine McCauley. She was what's called a religious sister, which is slightly different from being a nun in that a nun leads a much stricter monastic life. Sisters take a vow and they dedicate their lives to the Catholic religion, but they don't have to live confined to a type of monastery. So back in the day, Miss McCauley dedicated her life to teaching poor kids about Catholicism and the way of the good Lord. As an adult, she inherited quite a lot of money and so she decided that she would build schools where homeless and destitute women and poor or parentless children could learn. So far, so good. One can't fault the intentions of Macaulay, but charity it seems would turn out to be far from next to godliness. She got more women together, not just religious women, to help run the schools. They wore the black and white outfit that you might associate with nuns today. She called this group the Sisters of Mercy, because mercy was what they were supposed to be all about. The people they helped really were at the end of the line. Many of the kids lived on the streets and many of the women sold their bodies to get by, and had been abandoned or, in some cases, had merely been accused of sleeping with too many men. By the time Macaulay died in 1841 of tuberculosis, there were around 100 Sisters of Mercy working in 10 institutions. Soon those sisters would spread the word and institutions would open in different countries around the world. You can go to their website now and you'll see the charity calls itself the Mercy International Association and says it's dedicated to bring mercy to people who are poor, sick, and uneducated. These days, there are something like 5,500 Sisters of Mercy, as well as hundreds of thousands of people helping them. Their present track record doesn't seem so blemished and steeped in controversy. So what went wrong in the past? Macaulay might have had the right idea, but after she died, hell literally broke loose in those institutions. We might look at St. Vincent's Industrial School in Dublin, Ireland. Industrial schools were for the neglected, orphaned, or abandoned kids or women, and as the name suggests, the people sent to live in them were sent to work, sometimes making rosary beads or working in a laundry in such a fashion that today it would be called illegal child labor. The children living there were as young as three and as old as 16. In the 1900s, this school was put under scrutiny for the conditions there, and it was revealed that some of the sisters and some of the lay teachers were far from merciful people. The girls and boys that lived there had absolutely no time for leisure. In fact, leisure was not permitted. They either worked making beads, worked in the laundry, or they did chores that would leave them with calluses on their hands. What happened if they broke the rules? Well, firstly, there was a strict code of silence at the school. The kids, while living in large groups, were not supposed to talk to each other, laugh, or fool around. This kind of thing was seen as unwholesome. A commission would reveal that if they weren't physically beaten, they would often be humiliated by the nuns and lay workers, which would leave them with mental scars for the rest of their life. As you'll soon see, some of those kids grew up and are presently talking about these physical and mental scars. There were many schools for the destitute in Ireland run by the Catholic Church, so not all were run by the Sisters of Mercy. But since poverty was so pervasive, many young boys and girls and women without much hope ended up at various schools under different names but belonging to the Catholic religious order. They didn't get away with it, of course. Many years after these kids faced the horrors of their orphanages in schools or workhouses, they came out and told the world what happened to them. One man at the age of 70 described how his dormitory was full of kids who'd spend the nights banging their heads against the walls. He stayed at a place called the Nazareth House in Scotland, and he said the nuns would beat him regularly, and if they weren't beating him, they would humiliate other kids in front of him. He said the nuns would enter the rooms of the boys in the early hours, and if it was found that they had wet the bed, they'd take the kid out and beat him on the landing. 
Such trauma, of course, is one of the reasons for bedwetting. He said he lost his mother when he was young, and after that, his sister had tried to take care of him. This didn't work out, and he spent most of his time skipping school and hanging around the local shops. One day, he was just picked up off the streets and sent to Nazareth House. Hundreds of people came out and talked about the regime of violence they had suffered as children, with some of those people taking the Catholic Church to court for cruel and inhumane treatment. Some called the schools and workhouses a house of hell. Another person who experienced this said all the nuns were committed to was the destruction of will. Then you have the notorious Magdalene laundries run by certain Catholic orders. These were where so-called fallen women were sent to work in brutal conditions. What was a fallen woman? Well, perhaps it was a woman who wasn't living her life as society wanted her to live her life. Maybe they'd been prostitutes, or maybe they were just promiscuous, or perhaps they were merely poor and had nowhere to turn for help. The laundries were just another kind of industrial school. But the work was grueling and there was little or no pay for the workers. The abuses that happened there are similar to what we've already described. In this case, the systemic brutalization of young women. One former inmate who stayed with the Sisters of Mercy and worked in a laundry explained how she was stripped naked and beaten regularly. She said once a sadistic nun grabbed her by the hair and swung her around the room. She said she was starved, locked in cupboards, and not allowed to go to the toilet. When she was let out of the temporary prison, she had to stay in her soiled clothes. At the age of 12 or 13, she had enough and tried to set herself on fire, and although she didn't manage to kill herself, she was badly burned. As she screamed out in pain, the nuns told her she would not get to see a doctor and she was refused any kind of medicinal painkiller. She was then sent to work at one of the infamous Magdalene laundries where girls stayed in a cell with a bucket for a toilet. She once had to spend three days in a solitary confinement padded cell for merely being accused of stealing a candy. In that cell, there was no bed, no light, and no blankets. This is what she told the New York Times when she was a middle-aged woman. It was in the padded cell that it dawned on me that I would be there for life, that I'd be buried in a mass grave. There were whispers that went around. Like many others, she suffered from years of PTSD and anxiety and had constant nightmares about what happened to her when she was staying with those merciful people. As for rumors of a mass grave, in 1993, a mass grave outside of one of the laundries was discovered and it contained the remains of 155 people. The discovery happened when an order called the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity lost money on the stock exchange and had to sell some land. The discovery led to a massive scandal and soon people who worked in those laundries or anyone who'd been allegedly taken care of by one of the Catholic orders came out and talked about the abuse they'd suffered as children. Still, some members of the Catholic Church denied any wrongdoing, with two sisters formally belonging to the laundry saying, apologize for what? Apologize for providing a service? We provided a free service for the country. The Sisters of Mercy, however, has apologized for any abuses that took place over the decades and paid out around $140 million in 2009 in compensation to the many victims that came forward. Other orders that were made to make payments were the Christian Brothers and the Daughters of Charity and the Sisters of Charity and the Daughters of the Heart of Mary, and the list goes on. But as we speak, groups of people who say they were abused at the hands of the Sisters of Mercy and other purported charitable orders are still trying to get some compensation for what they went through. In 2019, a group of women who as children had been shipped from the UK to Australia said they still suffered from trauma. The woman said they all had to wear hearing aids because as kids they were smacked in the side of the head so often. One woman said there were 20 nuns where she stayed and only four of them treated the girls like human beings. She said to the media, in the evening, we had to sit on buckets to use the toilet before we went to bed, with the nuns standing and the older girls standing just watching us. That was dreadful, even for a little kid, to sit on a bucket and have an audience. None of the kids had toothbrushes and they were allowed only one shower a week, which is worse than today's prisons, even the most notorious places in the developed world. When the girls got their periods, the nuns told them that it was God's punishment, and if that was showing mercy, then perhaps those nuns might have picked up a dictionary. Now you need to watch The Most Evil Popes in the History of Mankind, or if you had enough evil, then take a look at this instead.